I was going to ask you um, about Badlands. On paper, I mean, that the talent in that band is off the hook. I mean, great, great players, great singer. Uh, people still regard those records as being, you know, all killer, no filler. Um, at the time, do you think there was any, uh, because of the, the break with Jake and Ozzy being so nasty, do you think there was any record business politics that sort of prevented Badlands from becoming bigger? Um, the record company politics that happened were uh, more not because of what happened with Ozzy. Uh, it's just because we signed with the wrong label. We we screwed up by being involved with Paul O'Neill and um, signing with Atlantic, who didn't, Jason Flom didn't like the band, didn't believe in the band. He was more in line with, say, what Skid Row did, which I like Skid Row, so don't get me wrong but he was looking for something more along that lines. I mean, at the time, you got to remember, a lot of bands were saying, yeah, we're doing this 70s thing, and we're going to go back to 70s, and Lynch Mob, we're doing 70s, and Blue Murder, we're going to do the 70s, and uh, what, what's the other one I'm thinking of here? Um, uh, there's somebody else in there that was doing 70s as yeah. well. King and, and oh, was Mr. Sort of... Big, Mr. Big, we're doing the 70s. Mm -hmm. Well, we did the 70s. I don't know what those other guys did, and I like their records, but we stayed true to what Jake's vision of the band was. I mean, when, I, when Jake and I, when I auditioned for Ozzy, we became friends. We stayed in contact under the guys that eventually he would leave Ozzy and he would start his own band. And it was going to be this very 70s sort of thing that he'd been kind of stockpiling this catalog of songs. People always say, how come he didn't write on the first record? Jake had been saving up all this stuff that he'd been writing that didn't necessarily fit Ozzy, that would fit this 70s sort of thing that he had in mind. And he wanted a 70s style singer and a 70s style drummer with 70s style, you know, the way the songs were arranged and production and all that. So he was very adamant about what he wanted. I liked the way Jake wrote. So I didn't feel like, oh, man, is, isn't anyone going to listen to my songs? I like Jake's songs and I got to write my own bass parts and Jake really kind of liked what it was I did and, and very seldom did he get involved. I'll give you an example of when he did is on Dreams in the Dark, that opening bass line. I actually wrote that, but I played it an octave lower. And he said, I really dig that part. Can you play it an octave higher? Why, yes, I can. And so that's how he would get involved in basically what it is I did, but he trusted what I did. He trusted what Eric did because Eric wrote just killer drum parts and he trusted what Ray did. And so it was like really kind of Atomic Kings ish. Everyone would throw in their, their part and it would turn into a Badlands song. And um, we would, we, we knew that going seventies that hard might be a hard sell. Mm -hmm. And because Jason Flom didn't like us and still doesn't, which is why you can't get the Badlands CDs, has nothing to do with all this other crap. It has to do with Jason Flom basically doesn't want that stuff out there because if he put it out, Badlands would get a gold record in an hour. We're yeah. sitting with about 485,000 copies when he, when he basically what happened is Ray did an interview when the second record came out, was going to come out. Ray had a serious dispute going on with Atlantic. And so Ray did an interview about Atlantic sucks and Jason Flom sucks and they wouldn't know what to do with a good record if it hit him in the head, blah, blah, blah. Well, in the meantime, the promo for the record's coming out for Voodoo Highway. And all of a sudden, they say, they read this interview where Ray just tears them up. Now, did we agree with Ray? Oh, yeah. Would we have said it in print? No, probably not. And so <laughs> they pulled our tour support right then. So there's our $14,000 a week tour support gone. Mm. And we have new management. We're signed with Tom Hewlett and, and Eddie Wenrick, who at the time were managing Warrant was their big gun. And they're saying they're not paying tour support. That They are not going to do it. And as a matter of fact, they put out a, a little thing saying anyone that worked that Voodoo Highway record, they could get fired. And two people from uh, New York offices, 
for Atlantic got fired for working the record on their own time. I know for a fact they got fired because I know them. Wow. And so we're no tour support. We So we put together our own tour, the band did. We basically hired a guy. I helped with it. We advanced the tour. We went out on our own, actually made money and did all that. But at that point, as soon as that happened, as soon as the uh, record came out, they let that record go, but they pulled the first one. So that the, the first record all of a sudden became a cutout. So it's sitting there still selling. And now you can't, if your store ran out of it, you can't reorder it. It doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And so now, because we are not their favorite, we're never their favorite son. Now we're really not their favorite son. They basically shelved our record, didn't work the second one. We kind of just did it on our own. They weren't good. They didn't care whether we went on tour. We wanted to go on tour. So yeah. we put our own tour together and had a booking agent. And we had other bands like when you saw us with Bang Tango and all that. But none of that stuff was done by the label. We were like persona non grata at the label at that point. And still to this day, and then they dropped us, which is great because we wanted to be dropped. Right. And, and we, because we, we didn't, we were never happy there. That was kind of something that just happened. They made a bunch of promises. Uh, titanium. Some of it came true. Titanium was owned by four people, Jason Flom being one of them, Paul O'Neill being one, Andy Sesher from Hit Parader was one. And we got a lot of press out of it because of it, but we were never happy with the label. We were never happy with Paul O'Neill's involvement with the band. We were never happy with what his production side of the record was. Jake, the good stuff you hear on that first record has nothing to do with Paul O'Neill has to do with what Jake's vision of it was and making the record sound the way that he wanted to make it sound. I mean, Paul wrote some lyrics here and there with Ray, but if you like that record, the guy that should get the production credit for that is Jakey Lee, not Paul O'Neill. And who, again, who, who exactly is Jason Flom? He's the head of Atlantic Records. Now he is Atlantic Records. Okay. At the time, he was an A&R guy. Okay. Now he's the guy. And okay. we are... I'm sure he doesn't think about us one time in the last 10 years, but those he's, records are never coming out. He's famous for Skid Row. Not, not si yeah, but he's, he's famous for not signing. He's famous for signing Skid Row. He's famous for not signing Twisted Sister. Twisted Sister got signed by the English right. Atlantic who flew over to New York and signed him and he's getting on the plane and he calls Jason Flom and says, you know, I'm prepared to be wrong, but I feel like it's fairly well documented that this English the president of uh, Atlantic in England uh, called Jason Flom. Hey, I just signed Twisted Sister and there's nothing you can do about it. But Jason Flom was not going to sign him and they ended up on Atlantic anyway, but it, it was somewhere else. He's Jason Flom is famous for that. Um, He's the he he's the he's the man in charge. He never he's the liked guy. us. Yeah, he's he never guy. liked us from the get go. Uh, he thought the musicianship was great, but he did not like the songs. He didn't like the direction. He didn't even, he didn't really like Dreams in the Dark when Jake and Ray wrote it. He just he would say, "I just don't hear it." He'd come down to the studio when we'd be recording, and go, I, "I don't hear it. I don't hear a song." He goes, "I don't hear any songs," and we'd be like, "Yeah, bite me. We like the songs." And unfortunately for Jason Flom, in the contract that we signed, we had right to create a control of what we did yeah I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a funny story so we're getting ready to do the second badlands record and we're writing for it and so they sent us thirty thousand dollars to go into a studio and record demos well we took that 30 grand and we lived off of it and jake had a really really nice professional series walkman that you could record on and he would record the rehearsals and he sent that back to atlantic and they thought we recorded it at a real studio. And so they came out to hear our new great songs, right? And so what we did, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with this band called Captain Beyond from the 70s. Yeah. And they're kind of like a prog fairly progressive. Yeah. So we would play some of their songs in soundcheck. So when they came out, Andy Session, Session and Jason Flom came to hear our new songs at the rehearsal. We rehearsed at a place called Mates in North Hollywood. Yeah. He comes out to hear it. We start playing Dancing Madly Backwards and Mesmerization Eclipse by Captain Beyond. 
and we play and, and they're both standing there and these are not radio songs at all and they're like looking at us with this look of abject terror like <laughs> and <laughs> they were like so shocked and then jake says yeah just kidding and then we played them the last time or whatever and it was actually probably good because even if they didn't like the last time they probably liked it a hell of a lot better than dancing madly backwards <laughs> raging yeah. river fear but it was you uh, gave, gave him something to compare it to so <laughs> captain beyond uh versus a real badland song you know i can't imagine why they didn't like us <laughs> <laughs> sound well, like you were kind of fucking with them a little bit anyway well they did it with they, they screwed with us we screwed with yeah. them i mean we would we would have interviews to do and Okay, Jake, you have a phone or at six o'clock in the morning with some I'm not getting up for no six o'clock yeah, in the morning. Phone. <laughs> Jimmy Page wouldn't get up for a six o'clock in the morning phone, yeah. so I'm not. And I'd be like, it's great, Jake's my roommate. I don't want to have to get up for a six o'clock phone or either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Badlands records are 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 very well respected. And as you say, if they were ever re-released and more widely available, they would I know people out there still want them and uh would love to have those you know available uh so well, is it a matter me, of it? Let, me, let me interrupt you want to know something one of the reasons that it won't is because if it's sold x amount of units we would recoup the reason that we can't we have no control of that is because we never recouped our recording advance so if all of a sudden those records sold we would recoup and that would mean we have now we paid back our debt we now have control of the masters. Remember when the record got released in uh, uh, the, the both records were released in England on some other funky label. And the reason it got pulled is because we didn't own the rights to put it out there. So oh, uh, right. They, right. they managed to get a hold of some of the masters. They re released it when Atlantic found out about it. They said, you can't put this out. We didn't approve of this. Um, they don't own the control of this. So now, it's the it's the recoupable rights. It's the recoupable right. It's a re because it's not recouped as the clause in your contract. Yep. yep. Wow. Because there's a couple of like, you know, shifty Jimmy kind of things you could have done. You could have re-recorded the albums and put them out on yeah, on your own. It's hard without Ray being around. Yeah. Right. I, I, I mean, mean, that's I, right. mean that's I mean, immediately after you're, you, you got fucked. Yeah. Well, you know what? You don't have that kind of foresight at the time. I mean, of course, people of course. say, how come there's never, how come there's not a Badlands reunion? Uh, Ray Gillen? Yeah, there's no Ray. Right. I so, mean, it, it would be hard to do it. I mean, anyway. the, most, the most identifying thing of, of Badlands right off, the first thing you're going to be identified with is Ray's voice. That's it's right. That way with every singer. Yeah. Or with every band with a singer. That's that's not and and you know, and then of course what Jake does and, and everything else, but without Ray, I mean Jake and and I I, I don't want to speak for him, he's always said he would never do it, and unless he changes his mind. I mean, if Jake called me tomorrow and said, Hey, uh, I'm gonna do a Badlands reunion tour, we're gonna get blah 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 to sing, you in? Yeah, what time are we leaving? Yeah, I'm in. I mean, sure. it's the biggest part of my legacy. I had a great time in it yeah. and Jake's my favorite guitarist yeah. and sure. I'd be interested. Do I think that's, let me, let me check my phone. No, he hasn't called today. So yeah. I don't think, I don't think that's going to be happening anytime soon, <laughs> but, but if Jake ever wanted to go do something that was revolved around something like that, I, I'm sure it would not be called Badlands, but I don't know. It's his call, whatever he wants to do. Yeah. He knows that, you know, he's asked me, would you ever do something like that? Yeah. I, because that was his band, but it was also my band. And yeah. to me, you know what I mean? You know, right. was I main writer? No. Um, could I write songs with Jake? Sure. Um, will we? Yeah, maybe someday. I don't know. But well, this, you guys I, have I, fans. You guys did. You guys made your mark. It was kind of a fucking super group. Yeah. Man. Kind of square. Know, except for that unknown bass player. <laughs> well, I don't know. There's there's three of them with the same last name. Yeah, and they're all over the fucking place. Yeah, I know. There's, and they're and killing Louisiana, it. In Louisiana, there's probably even more of them. Chase on's as common as the name Smith in Louisiana. Oh well, uh, do they all play bass? That would be <laughs> every every single Chase on in Louisiana <laughs> plays the bass. It's really weird. Oh, so you got got uh, 
you know, bass on. Just change it to bass on. <laughs> well, my favorite bass player is Hiram Chason, who was the bass on player in Louisiana. Okay. 